our world. Six continents. 195 countries. 10,000 religions. 250,000 cities. 6.8 billion people. And one economic problem. In this series, we're going to find out more about it and why we have it and what we do to fuel it and different ways to deal with it. We'll be interrogating you, your family and your friends, workers, business people, corporate giants, foreign nationals, multinationals, a few murky figures from history and even governments. All with the same economic problem. What do we want? What do we need? And how are we going to get it? Much like these ants, we live in a world where we work together and compete with one another for the resources we need to build and sustain our lives. We enjoy good fortune and bad, wars, natural disasters, as we try to live and support our families. Now understanding this basic idea that there are limited resources for which we're all competing to make a life is the first step to understanding how our economy works. This is Lyndon, Evie and Kate. Every day, like most of us, they have to make choices about how to utilise the resources they have at their disposal to live as best they can. Each of them, consciously and unconsciously, is constantly having to make economic decisions about what to buy, what to consume and, importantly, what to resist buying. These decisions are necessary because their resources are scarce, but their needs and wants are practically unlimited. And in the most basic sense, this is what economics is all about. Like us, every day they have to confront the fundamental economic problems of scarcity, choice and something called opportunity cost. Understanding these concepts is fundamental to the economic way of thinking. More than ever before in history, the human race is having to confront this age-old economic problem. Resources are scarce, but our wants are unlimited. To illustrate just how pressing the economic problem is, now more than ever before, let's look at our history on this planet. Mankind has existed for around 100,000 years, and it took this long, up until the year 1900, for the human population to grow to 2 billion. But then, in the next 100 years, the world's population tripled to 6 billion. In fact, estimates suggest that the world's population will reach 10 billion within the next 50 years. Now, 10 billion people, each with a constantly evolving list of wants and needs. Well, you do the maths, but to me, that's pretty much unlimited. But getting back to those scarce resources, what exactly are they? Well, resources are those things that go into the production of goods and services. And generally, they can be divided into three categories. First, there are natural resources. That's all the stuff we get from nature that we use to sustain our modern existence. Fossil fuels, natural gas, minerals, agricultural land, forests, water, even the air. Economists sometimes refer to all these natural resources simply as land. Secondly, there's human resources. That's entrepreneurs, builders, architects, municipal workers, accountants, scientists, lawyers, cleaners, miners, farmers, sports people, actors, musicians, doctors, hey, even economists. And thirdly, 
there are man-made resources. Now, these can be the capital goods such as power stations, factories, buildings, equipment, machinery, aircraft, computers, and then all of the other man-made products used in production. Things like plastics, glass, silicon, paints, chemicals, and millions of other man-made resources. Because of the scarcity of resources, we as a society must make choices about how these resources are to be used, we hope, to satisfy as many of our needs and wants as possible. Now, what do we mean by needs and wants that are unlimited? Peculiar to us humans is that, on top of all the things we need for our physical survival, we also have a whole bunch of wants, goods and services we desire but which are often not really essential for our continued existence. These could be things we think will give us pleasure or make us more fulfilled, or things we hope will provide us with higher status in our society and among our friends. Now, wants and desires differ from person to person, but in our consumption-driven world, we can be sure that they're always changing and always growing. But, as we know, there are over six billion people on our planet, and every one of us has unlimited wants and needs. How do we even begin trying to satisfy everyone's needs with the resources available? To start with, how do we feed six billion people? Our population keeps growing, but the land available to cultivate crops doesn't. In fact, the amount of land available for farming is actually shrinking all the time, as more and more of it gets covered by our expanding cities and suburbs. So, it's complicated. Our needs and wants are unlimited, but the resources available to us are scarce. As a society, we constantly have to make economic choices. But before we try to understand how a society tries to make these choices, Let's take a closer look at how we as individuals cope. This is Lyndon. We met him earlier. Now, Lyndon's passion is soccer. He loves attending matches and is a keen player himself. Because it's such a rewarding part of his life, Lyndon regularly puts aside money to spend on his passion. Now, in doing so, he makes frequent economic choices to spend his money on soccer-related consumption instead of or something else. Now today, Lyndon has decided that he's going to spend some money on new soccer gear. And he's found a pair of boots that he really likes. But Lyndon's resources are limited, and it's winter, and what he really needs is a tracksuit. Although he would love those boots, he cannot afford both the boots and the tracksuit. Lyndon is being forced to make an economic choice, a choice as to how he allocates his limited resources, his money. Now, in making this choice, he's having to sacrifice or deny himself something else that he also really wanted. For all of us, or nearly all of us, our resources are limited. We're forced to make choices about what we buy because we don't have the resources to buy everything. And for this reason, every choice we make implies a cost. Because in choosing one thing, we choose not to buy another thing which we might otherwise have bought, the next best alternative. In economics, we don't just consider the monetary value of the item we choose to buy, but we also take into account the value of the good or service we sacrificed in making any given choice. Now, we call the cost of this choice the opportunity cost, the value of that good or service that we had to deny ourselves when selecting the item we chose. The opportunity cost of the boots is the tracksuit, and the opportunity cost of the tracksuit is the boots. Now let's look at this term, opportunity cost, a bit more closely. As I said before, the opportunity cost is the value of something we had to give up in order to choose something else. More formally, the opportunity cost of choice is the value to the decision-maker of the best alternative that could have been chosen, but wasn't. Lyndon could have bought any number of soccer-related items, but what he really wanted 
the thing that was a real sacrifice was letting go of those boots. Instead of watching this video, you could have been doing any number of other things. Make a list of those things and then decide which one of them you would have preferred doing most if you weren't watching this video. OK, so whatever it was you thought you'd rather be doing, then that's your opportunity cost. It's not all the things you give up, just the one you valued the most. It is not only people like you and me, individuals, who have to make choices in order to meet their needs and satisfy their wants. Governments and businesses also have to make choices, and these are not always easy or popular choices. Government's choices are often spelt out in national, provincial and local budgets, where they explain to the nation how they intend to spend the money they're going to collect from taxes and other sources. In making these decisions, governments also experience opportunity cost. Spending more on defence, for instance, will usually mean there's less money available for social spending on things like education or healthcare. And the same applies to local governments. A local municipality might, for instance, have to make a choice between spending their recreational budget on upgrading a park or erecting a statue in front of the town hall. The municipality has to make a choice, and the choice will involve opportunity costs. If it is decided to erect the statue, there will not be enough resources to upgrade the park. So the opportunity cost of the statue is therefore an upgraded park. And if the municipality decides to upgrade the park, the opportunity cost will be the statue. Businesses also have to make economic choices. Often, they have to make choices as to whether they should use the resources they've accumulated to expand their business or whether to distribute them to shareholders. These decisions relate to whether resources are being spent on investment or consumption. Just like business, you and I have to decide whether to spend our time and money on consumption or investment. When you decided to enrol in Economics 1, you made a choice. You decided to study, as opposed to doing whatever else it is you might have wanted to do. And choosing to spend your time and money on this degree is known as investment spending. More specifically, investment in human capital. When you invest, you don't expect to derive immediate benefits, but you do hope to reap benefits in the future. In this case, when you've passed your exams and secured a good job. So, by enrolling in this degree, you're investing in your human capital. If, instead of studying, you'd use the money and time on recreational activities, like going to the movies and eating out, you would have spent your resources on consumption too. Now, for you, the opportunity cost of studying might be recreation. And the opportunity cost of recreation is studying. Or the opportunity cost of investment is consumption, and vice versa. This concept, a cornerstone of economics, is something you can take with you and use throughout your life. Those of you who have the will regularly to sacrifice consumption in favour of investment will be likely to have greater future wealth. So, we've established that economics looks at how society uses limited resources to satisfy unlimited wants and needs, and that a scarcity of resources means that choices have to be made. And every choice involves an opportunity cost, that is, the value of the best alternative that wasn't chosen. It's time to take a closer look at some of the fundamental questions that are studied in economics. These are questions that every society, every economy, it doesn't matter whether it's capitalist, communist, socialist, or some other kind of system, all have to answer. The first question is, what should we produce? And when we've answered that, we must decide how much of it to produce. Now, we've seen that we cannot produce all the goods and services that people want, so we must decide which goods and services to produce and in what quantities. As you know, we humans all have needs and wants. We need food, drink and shelter, and we want cars, television sets, computers. 
economics tries to work out how best to satisfy our needs and wants within the constraints of the limited resources available. And so, those are our first questions. What's to be produced and how much of it? The next question all societies have to confront is, how are goods produced? There are many ways of making something. For example, a car can be manufactured using mainly human labour, which is labour intensive, or using mainly robots and machines, which is capital intensive. This decision is usually based on decisions about which method is cheaper and more efficient, and these decisions can change from country to country. For example, it may be more efficient to use capital intensive techniques in Germany, where labour is very expensive, but labour intensive techniques in India, where labour is cheap. Now, sometimes a decision on how to produce something is easy. For example, it's probably not such a good idea to build a house using gold bars. But most of the time, these decisions are more complicated. For instance, should a house be built with bricks or wood or concrete blocks? Because the factors of production, our resources are scarce, these decisions are important. In New York, most construction uses steel or concrete. There's not an abundance of timber for building. Whereas in Neisner, there are a lot of timber homes because there are ample and well-managed forests in the area. When resources are used efficiently, more goods and services can be produced, and so more needs and wants can be satisfied. So efficient and effective use of the factors of production contribute to economic growth and the wealth of an economy. And we have to work out who are we producing these goods for? Well, simply, Goods and services are usually produced for people who both want and have the ability to purchase them. That is, people who have the income to pay for them. But this raises another question. What determines the income that people have? In a market system, production generally follows income. This means that goods and services are produced for people who can afford to buy them. And in a market system, People earn their income by taking part in the production process, by selling their factors of production to producers. So, people who sell more of a resource or sell a resource that's valued more highly will earn a better income. And, as we know, the higher people's incomes are, the more goods and services they can afford and the more of their needs and wants they can satisfy. So, People who will sell more of a resource, or sell a resource that's more valuable, will earn a better income. And, as you know, the greater your income is, the more goods and services you can afford, and the more you're able to satisfy your needs and wants.